morning, you are faithful, you are sovereign, you are wise, you are glorious over all heaven and all earth. Father, we think of our world today, so much tragedy, so much despair, Paris, Baghdad, Kenya, Beirut, uh, an earthquake, I think, in Japan, Father, just so much that is going on, so much turmoil, and yet, Father, you reign above all these things. You are to be found in all these things as the one constant, the one satisfying thing in this universe, Father, is you alone. And Father, I pray that this morning as we open your word together, as we try to fix our minds on what you have to speak to us, Lord, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be open today, that our souls, Father, would breathe in the clean air of the gospel so that we might exhale your will in all things. Father, please help me to speak. Please help me be clear. Father, be my sermon. Preach my sermon through me. This I ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. You can be seated. Good morning, man. That's a nice cattle call. Good morning. I, uh, and I, I didn't get to see, so every, everybody, did everybody get to go, basically? Everybody went? That's a, nothing, really. Did, did anybody go? Did anybody get to go? Okay, all right. Well, don't say yeah like I, I, I asked and then nobody said anything. Jeez, oh, goodness sakes. You, um, mutton busting is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. They won't let me do it, though. They won't let me get on, kill a, a lamb. <laughs> so, yeah, I can't, I can't do it. I wouldn't know what to do out there, but... So the language that the family on mission is fluent in is the gospel. If you have your notes this morning, that's where we start. The language the family on mission is fluent in is the gospel. And we spent the last two weeks then focusing on the gospel's content, right? The truth that we're called to constantly speak to one another in love as a family so that we can be built up together into maturity, into Christ. And so we've talked what... We've talked why, and now we're going to start to zero in, God willing, on how. How do we create a family culture, a family culture where what's normal is for people to speak that gospel to one another regularly, right? A culture where uh, we understand every sin and issue, all of them, that stands in the way of our faithfulness to Jesus and his commands as ultimately a gospel issue. Since, see, why would we say that? Because all sin, all of it, every single thought, action, deed, whatever it is, all sin is actually the result of unbelief. That's what Jesus teaches in John 16, that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin concerning its unbelief in Jesus. All sin has its source in our unbelief in God as he has been revealed in Jesus Christ. So how do we create or facilitate a family culture where it's normal to think that way? It's normal to talk that way. It's normal to process things that way. Well, it starts with you and me. Right? We have to become fluent. We have to learn how to rehearse the truths of the gospel in everything. And to, we have to be able to, to speak it. We have to keep going back to it, speaking it into everyone's lives and have everyone speaking it into our lives, asking that question all the time. How is this in line with the truth of the gospel? How does the gospel inform this decision that I need to make or this behavior or this action or these thoughts? The gospel is that big, right? It's, it's not just a few facts about how somebody enters the kingdom of God. It's everything. So our lives, we can begin asking, what does how I'm speaking, what does how I'm thinking, behaving in this moment say about what I actually believe right now? What does this behavior, these words, these actions, what are they saying about what I believe right now? Because our lives will flow out of what we believe. And what should we believe What did God do to save us? Well, he sent his son, right? He lived a perfect life, died for us, forgives us, takes away our sins, gives us his righteousness. He conquered sin and Satan and death 
for us. And then he sent us his Holy Spirit to fulfill his mission. Well, what are the implications of all that for my life? What does it produce in my life? Because the gospel is the good news of what God has done for us, right? We don't do it. We live our lives in light of it. The gospel works through us. So it's actually about what Jesus is doing, not what I'm doing, which is very important to understand the difference. That's the hope of glory, Christ in you, not me and Jesus, but Jesus in me, living his life through me, him in us. And so the implications of all that are that we have a new life. And it's a life that constantly displays the fruit of being sanctified. It shows up in your life when you believe the gospel. You see it, but don't let that confuse you. Sanctification is not getting better at doing good works. Sanctification is you moving from unbelief to belief on your seat there. Sanctification is you moving from unbelief to belief in every part of your life. The more that you see Jesus for who he is, the more you believe him, the more you're being sanctified. So the mantra of our lives is not, I used to be a bad person, but now I'm a better person. Actually, if you're truly being sanctified, you realize as time goes on that you're a worse person than you originally thought. I thought I was pretty good, but it turns out I'm actually a mess. That's how you're probably feeling as you're being sanctified. But what's actually going on is that God knows you believe the gospel now, and its grace is sufficient for you, and you finally see that you were like that all along. You just couldn't have handled it before. He opened your eyes to see that your struggle to be like him, to be conformed to the image of his son, is way harder than you originally thought. That's growth. That's growth, because here's what's really going on. When people are growing in godliness, they are more and more impressed with Jesus and less and less impressed with themselves. That's growth. That's humility. And that humility comes to us when God has been gracious enough to show us what we're like if you put us next to Jesus. And the more you see Jesus for who he is and yourself for who you aren't, the more amazing Jesus looks to you as time goes on. That's the kind of sanctification we want in the family, where we're all growing from unbelief to belief more and more all the time. So as we get more mature, we get more humble. We get more loving. We get more broken. We don't become self-righteous. We don't become sin scouts and nitpicking. We see Jesus for who he is more and more, which means we see ourselves for who we are more and more, and it breaks us, and it moves us towards people, not away from people or above people. And we begin to move from unbelief to belief more and more all the time in the person and the work of Jesus in every area of life. Now, World Harvest Mission actually has a, a diagram for, for understanding this, for how this looks, and it's actually very helpful. So how about this? We're going to put this up on here. A good thing I clipped my fingernails. All right. Okay. <laughs> Let me try to show this to you here. I believe in straight lines. Just give me a second. Okay. Now. When you first come to Jesus, okay, when you first believe the gospel, your view of God's holiness is probably very small. Yet, not because you've done something deliberately wrong to make it small, but you don't have a, a huge understanding of God's holiness, right? So this is you, all of you. We're going to assume it's a bald lady. I'm not going to draw a lady hair on it. But we have God's holiness, and then on this side, my sinfulness. So when you first come to Jesus, probably your understanding of God's holiness is very small. You don't know that much yet. But also, probably, your understanding of your own wickedness and your own sinfulness is probably also very small. And you knew that you needed a Savior, but you, know, you, you probably don't have an entire grasp on how wicked and lost you really were. But as time goes on, as you mature in Christ, as you come to know Jesus more, the cross becomes bigger and bigger in your understanding. So as time goes on, 
You become more aware of God's holiness, more aware of your sinfulness. What's happening? You see that the gap between you and God was way bigger than you originally thought. And when that happens, look at what happens to your view of the cross, to your view of Jesus. It gets larger and larger and larger because it's the, you, you realize, I thought I was here. I'm here, right? So how big and great and sufficient must Jesus be that he closed the gap that big for me? right? That I was this far from God, not that far, this far. And as time goes on, it just widens. You say, Jesus was sufficient enough to save me when I was so far from being like him. And you start to realize as time goes on, I never could have been like him on my own. So it increases your view that the bigness of the cross increases your view of God's holiness, increases your view of your own sinfulness. And as that happened, Jesus progressively looks more and more and more amazing to you. That's sanctification. That's what we're after. We move from unbelief to belief in every part of our lives. So we get more amazed as time goes on that God could ever love a sinner that's this far from him. And it just gets further and further. That's how we're being sanctified. The deeper our understanding, the bigger the cross. The bigger, what's the word of the cross? The gospel. It gets bigger over time. That's a much better, much more Christ-centered picture of sanctification than one where the focus is just on me and my behavior. So instead of, it's on God, right? The focus is on how great God is through the lens of the cross, through the lens of the gospel as my belief in it increases. So let's go back now to Romans 1 together. Okay, we're going to go down to verse 24. We looked at 16 through 23 last week. Let's go to Romans 1 now, verse 24. There's there's a progression in Romans 1 that helps us see the big picture very clearly here. And we want to be able to get a grasp on this. What does Paul reveal to us? The gospel reveals God's power for salvation. And so when he does that, when he realizes that the, the, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, that's the context that he begins to tell us what sin actually is, what we're actually fighting in ourselves, what is wrong with the world. Here's the truth that we need. And what we're doing as we study this is we're saying, how are we to understand how the gospel affects our everyday lives? How does this gospel that is the power of God for salvation, what does it do in my life? What does it do in my relationships? How does it affect my work and my family and all these different things? Well, Paul is going to do this for us in this text. So God has, what did he start out by saying? That God has made himself known very clearly to people through creation, right? Through what he's made, there are invisible divine attributes that are very clear now. If you look around us, if you travel the world or just look at pictures, you can see that there's something big out there that's behind all this. Because what do you see? You see power, might, glory, splendor, intricacy, attention to detail, imagination, beauty. You see all of that. All those things are evident in the creation. And so when we see those things where we should have said, who is responsible for all of this? so that we can know him and praise him and worship him. Instead, we said, Paul is telling us that there's a God, but I'm going to suppress that. I'm not going to give him credit for it. I don't want to do that. I'll exchange this truth about God for lies, and I'll exchange the creator for the created. I'll worship the creation, not objects. Or I'll worship the creation. I'll worship objects, not God. And Paul tells us that because we do this with everything, with everything, everything, God actually hands us over to the lust of our hearts, to impurity and to the dishonoring of our bodies. That's the wrath that is being revealed that he talked about in verse 18, is God giving us over to all this, right? So let's look at 24 to the first part of verse 26, Romans 1. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And now Paul is going to give an example of, that, of how that plays itself out in humanity. Let's look at the second part of 26 and then 27. 
For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. So Paul, to give us a picture of this exchange, he gives us a very clear one, and he talks about homosexuality. So we have to understand the context. Homosexuality is not somehow worse than all the other sins, right? It's, it's because later in this same text, he's going to give us the whole list of how this plays out, of all the ways we make this exchange. So all humanity is in Romans 1. All of us have done this. All of us are here. And so I just, can I just caution you, beloved, against creating a hierarchy of sins because this is what we do, and then we put sexual sins at the top, and we put homosexuality at the top of that, and it's just one example, right? It's, it's one very clear picture that, that there, there are those of us that would be so consumed and burning with passion to exchange the truth of God for a lie of worshiping a false God that we would actually decide to be intimate with what we are, Right? So you wouldn't be with the opposite sex. You would be so in love with yourself, so consumed with worship of yourself that you would have to be intimate with what you are, the same gender. So it's, it's one picture of that exchange. Guys, there was much more to Sodom and Gomorrah than homosexuality, okay? In Ezekiel 16, it states that they were arrogant, they were overfed and unconcerned, they didn't help the poor and the needy. So there was more going on there. And, and beloved, we, we have alienated an entire demographic because we haven't gone deeply enough into the gospel in Romans 1. We have to understand what God is doing here. So when we do this, when we make this exchange, God gives us up to our lusts. He gives us up. He says, you're longing for something lustfully that can never satisfy you, so I'm going to give you over to that. Because only I can satisfy you, and I want you to know that. Right? So that's, that's God's wrath woven into creation to help us wake up. So God doesn't even give the illusion that other things can satisfy you. He lets you feel that they don't. And so we get worse. What happens because they don't satisfy us? Does it always send us running to God? No, we become addicts. And all of us are addicts. All of us. It's just a question of what you're addicted to. Food, drink, the approval of others, perfect plans, perfect strategies, everything working out for you. That's called control. Some of us worship control. We don't think of it in those terms. We don't think of it in that moment as I'm worshiping a false god when I've got to have control, but that's what you're doing. Fornication, pornography, homosexuality, all these things. We're all addicts. And remember, when you look to anything for acceptance, security, fulfillment, and it's not God, that's idolatry. That's what Paul makes clear here. All sin can be boiled down to false worship, to worshiping a false God. We are all worshipers at heart. In your notes, we're all worshipers at heart. At the core of who we are, we are constantly worshiping something. Worshiping actually isn't singing songs. When we gather here to split hairs, although it's not really necessary, we're praising through singing. Worship is building your life on something. Right? Whatever becomes the defining thing in your life, that is what you worship. Whatever determines your thoughts, mood, behaviors, actions, and has the most influence in your life, that is your God. That is what you worship. So the tragic thing is, we will worship things we hate. We will worship things we can't stand. We will worship things that make us miserable. But if it defines me, if it controls my life, if it determines my mood, determines how I think, determines how I act, I'm worshiping it. And all of us, either all the time or sometimes, worship false gods, and the true God will give us over to it. And the beauty in that is that it doesn't work. 
Our false worship is a means God uses to bring us to himself. It doesn't work. What does it lead to? An ongoing striving and desiring for more because whatever we worship in the world that isn't God refuses to satisfy us. That's because you and I were only meant to worship the one who can truly satisfy God himself. And so he gives us over to those things. So that's the text up to verse 27, right? God gives us over to our dishonorable passions, to our lust, which let's, let's define lust as craving for something, from something that can never satisfy the craving. Craving for something, from something that can never satisfy our craving, but it gets worse, right? When we realize that whatever we crave can't satisfy us, then we pervert it. Our idolatry leads to our perversion. Now, I know initially this might sound like a stretch to you, but I want you to try to think through what we're, we're talking about here. Parents, we can do this with our kids. We can make idols out of our kids. But then they don't satisfy us like we hoped. They don't do everything we want them to do. You, you, I mean, I'm, I, I say these kinds of things a lot. And I'm, I'm trying to, you know, to... To catch myself, but but we, we can worship our kids, man. My 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 kid is everything to me. If I didn't have them in my life, I, I wouldn't know who I am. I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know how to survive. Right? And I mean, it's it's a, it's a wonderful thing to love your kids. And I'm not, my goodness, man. I'm not talking about that. I'm just I'm just saying. Then what what we try to control them, right? They're never going to be perfect, no matter how hard we try. Some of us probably still think we can raise perfect kids. Wake up. You can't do it. Okay? You can't. But we, we pervert parenting. We, we pervert our kids by trying to make them into something they were never meant to be. They weren't meant to be our satisfaction, our, you know, the, the, the means of what makes us happy. They were never meant to be that. And so think about what that attitude towards your kids will do to how you treat them. We'll try to control them and, and get overly obsessed with them and we're never meant to put all this weight and pressure on our kids now think if you do that with sexuality what are you, you're going to become more and more perverted right if you do that with food you're going to become a glutton if you do that with drink you'll become an alcoholic if you do that with work you'll become a workaholic which is funny because you'll hate your boss when you're a workaholic, you, you, you won't be able to stand your job, or if somebody's above you, you won't be able to stand them because he or she or the job won't give you what you hope to get from it. And you'll despise your job, but you can't stop doing it. You've got to pay the bills. So then what will you do? You'll try to control it. You'll try to make it the dream that you wanted it to be. You will you'll start to gossip and you'll start to gripe and you'll start to complain and you'll start to loathe it because you've got to shape it into what you wanted it to give you. Dishonorable passions will come out in dishonorable actions in every sphere of life. That's on your sheet. Dishonorable passions will come out in dishonorable actions in any and every sphere of life. And in verse 27, Paul brings up how that happens with homosexuality, men committing shameless acts with other men, but he doesn't stay there. Look at verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So not only do we give ourselves up to dishonorable passions, but our minds are so twisted that we do all kinds of crazy things. And so we read that far in that text, and we were like, that's, that's right. They're, they've been given over. They're perverted. They're disgusting. It's awful what they do. And then let's look at 29 through 32. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, Malice. They are full of envy. He's talking about mankind. It's very clear. By the time we get to Romans 3, it's as clear as day. 
They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, right? We're tracking with those. That's right, that's right. Strife, conflict, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they were so twisted, right? They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. He's talking about all of us. We wouldn't put gossip and disobeying your parents alongside homosexuality on the badness list, would we? But God does. Gossip is the result of idolatry, of making this exchange, of false worship. Something you worship that isn't God causes you to talk about people behind their back. That, that's what Scripture is teaching us. Every fruit can be traced back to the root of unbelief and false worship. Maybe you worship your own approval, so you got to make other people look bad. Maybe you worship your view of how things should be, so you got to talk about people behind their back. We gossip because we're idolaters. Our kids disobey us. Why? Because they're idolaters. They've done the very same things. We all make the same exchange. By the time we get to Romans 3, like I said, Paul is so clear on the state of all humanity. Every one of us in this room has done something here. Every single one of us make this exchange and make it in other ways as well. So what's, which by the way, right? So where's, how do we fix that? Right? How do we address that? What's the power to undo that? The gospel. Nothing else. Okay? Nothing else. Every single behavior, every single behavior that's destructive in our lives is the result of us starting with the wrong object of worship. Every sinful behavior in the world can be traced back to worshiping something other than God. You see how this, this, you don't have to show it, Peter, or whoever's back, my glasses are down, but guys, that, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not like you can't ever take refuge in the fact that you weren't gay, right? Because you gossip, and they're on the same list. I mean, it's, it's, guys, it's, it's meant to be devastating. It's meant to get you to say, who then can be saved? Right? That, that's what it's meant to do. So what is Paul doing for us here? How does all this help us with gospel fluency and speaking the truth in love to one another? Paul is doing something foundational for us, and he's giving us a fruit-to-root application. That's, that's what he's doing. Sin starts in unbelief somewhere. It starts in the root of wrong worship. That sprung up into a tree that produced fruit that was unrighteous. It was not the fruit of the Spirit, right? The fruit was rebellion. It's destructive. So let's walk through Paul's process here. This is a process by which we can learn to speak the truth of the gospel and love to one another. It's, it's, it's one very, uh, I hope, concrete way to go about that. Because the thing we want to do in every area where we put our faith and trust in something other than Jesus to satisfy us is to come to the understanding again and again and again that Jesus is the better. Always. He's always the best. He's always the true object of worship that will satisfy no matter what the longing. No matter what the longing, Jesus is enough. So it's not like when we're going through something, we, we can treat the gospel kind of like, like yeah, you know, I, I, I know that, but what I need is, no, no, no. Something's not wrong with the information. It's not that it's not complete enough. It's that we don't believe it yet. Right? That, that's, that's when we still feel that, oh, I don't really, that's unbelief. That's unbelief. So Jeff Vanderstad actually gave a, a great example of, uh, of applying this, right? So just, just real quick, and then we're going to work through this, this process together. Let's say that you're in a small group or something, 
maybe Sunday school class or something or, or whatever, and, and a, a friend walks in that you're in this with, and you say, hey, hey, how's it going? What's sometimes the first thing out of somebody's mouth at 5, 36 o'clock? Oh my gosh, man, a terrible day at work today. Just terrible. You say, well, well, well what happened? Oh, my boss, you know, my, my boss is such a jerk, you know. And, and, and usually, now usually, I, I, I do this, the same thing. Usually what we do is we're like, yeah, no, tell me about it, you know. And my boss, you think your boss is bad, my boss, you know, right? And we just, we start complaining and grumbling. And, and what just happened? That fast, we're in false worship. That fast. That's what that is. What are we doing? Things that ought not to be done, right? Let there be no grumbling or complaining. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building up. How do we get to false worship so fast? Because the object of our worship was wrong in that moment. So maybe what we start to do as we're learning together and as we're growing together is we say, as, as maybe that, that's going on, we say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This isn't the fruit of the Spirit. No, our, our worship is focused on the wrong thing right now, man. We're, we're worshiping our bosses. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah, you are. Right? In that moment, your boss is the pivot point of your life. They're the force in your life that's controlling your behavior. Because what are you saying in that moment? My life stinks because of my boss. Or my life, whatever it is, put it in there. Look what we've done. And that, guys, we've made our bosses in that moment into Pharaoh. My boss is Pharaoh. He rules my world. He's my God. Whatever he does makes my world good or makes my world bad. That's my God. Now, what do we need in that moment? We need to repent, right? We need to repent of our sin. But here's the thing. What would repentance look like in that situation? Right? What would it look like in that moment? Because nobody can repent for real in that moment unless they see that Jesus is a better boss. That's where they've gone wrong. That's where their idolatry is. Jesus speaks into bad bosses. Repentance isn't in that moment. You know what? You're right. I'm gonna, I'll stop complaining. Never mind. I'm sorry. Shouldn't have been complaining. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's changing your mind. It's moving even in that moment because this exchange is happening from unbelief to belief. So we can say to one another, let's think this through, man. We, we have our eyes on the wrong God. Don't forget, and, and beloved, outside of the example, don't forget who your boss is. It's not the guy that signs your paycheck. It's Jesus Christ. He's your Lord and your King, and he's an amazing boss. Is it a raise you want? You're a co-heir with Christ. You're a co-heir with Christ. How will he not also, with Jesus, freely give us all things? That's Romans 8. You're a co-heir with Christ. How can you ever get any better pay than that? You want a higher position? You're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. How can you get any higher than that in your nine to five? Or your four to six the next morning. You farmers, blow me away, man. I'm serious. I'd... Starting my day, Thomas, my next door neighbor, has been on his day for four, three, four hours sometimes. That blows my mind. Right? But you want affirmation? God the Father says, I'm pleased with you. Like I'm pleased with my son, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who's in charge of the universe. You want more accolades? He's given you all that is Christ. You're a co-heir with him. Everything that's true of Christ is true of you. What more do you want? You've got the best boss in the universe. So repent and worship your Lord instead of your earthly boss. So now maybe as we're working through that, the response is, that's right, I forgot. I forgot Jesus is amazing. Right? He's amazing. I can go to work and say, man, I'm getting paid so well, it's awesome. I hold a high position, it's incredible. Nobody knows it. 
But I'm actually, this guy that works, I'm seated with Christ because of Christ. We're kind of like the bosses. You guys ever watch uh, Undercover Boss? Or the guy dresses up or the lady and they go to work and work with the, the little peons, you know, and, and if they don't know it's them, <laughs> right? That's, that's, we're kind of like that, right? That we, we have everything Jesus has, but they don't know that. The people we work with don't know that. We're with the one who's in charge of the universe. We're his child, but we just show up in everyday life and we start to realize that we're living like Jesus did. I'm showing up in life. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting honored well. I'm not being treated well. I'm not getting affirmation. But it's okay because I have a boss who knows and I'm getting paid for doing this. I don't even deserve to get paid. I deserve the wages of sin, which is death. But instead we get the, rate, the, the wages of righteousness, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we didn't even do the work. It's amazing who Jesus is. So go to work for him tomorrow. Repent. You were worshiping the wrong boss. Could you imagine if that's how we talk to each other? That's how we helped each other through things. That speaking the truth that is in accordance with Jesus in love to one another. That's family talk. That's gospel fluency. And we've got to do that because our tendency is to fall back into the Romans 1 progression of worship where we aren't even aware of it, but we're worshiping a false God. So we aren't trying to fix each other's outward behavior. In your notes, we're after the inward attitude of worship that took place before the behavior even started. We have to get to the worship, and that's what the gospel does. So here's what that looks like. Let me... Switch this up a little here. This here. So, let's do it. We'll do it like this. Okay. There's a tree. More or less. Okay. Now, the fruit on this tree, you know this, right? Comes from whatever the root is. Whatever's in here is what's growing up in here. Now, what kind of fruit do we want in our lives as believers? We want the fruit of the Spirit. We want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Now, when we see something that isn't in ourselves or in a brother or sister that's contrary to that, we have to trace the fruit to the root. Okay? This is happening. Whatever's happening, whatever fruit there is is because of the root. So when we see a destructive behavior, a wrong behavior, a wrong attitude, whatever, in ourselves or in a brother or sister, we have to figure out what's going on here, right? What's at the root of that? And there are four key questions to walk through with ourselves or others when we see this, when we're aware of this. The first question, talking about what's at the root, okay, who is God? What do I believe about who God is, right? At the very root of ourselves, we have a picture of who God is as he has been revealed in Jesus Christ, right? If, if that's not who we're worshiping, if that's not what the fruit is, then we're worshiping a false God, right? We know that. So now, how do we know who God is? By what God has done, right? What has he done? So, what God has done reveals who God is. We always know that about him, right? That he's completely holy, and everything he does flows out of his perfect character, right? So next, now that we have this down, next we asked, ask, who am I? Right? Or who are we? And out of that flows the last question. What do I do? All right, we have that. It's more or less legible. Okay. Because what I do flows out of what I believe about who God is and what he's like, what he's done and who I am. So our being leads to our doing. Our being leads to our doing. Our identity is the source of our works. Now, just real quick as an aside, okay? The world... The world looks at life this way.
doing leads to being, right? This is how the world sees everything, right? And it's absolutely backwards. We know this because if, if you, you, know, you meet somebody for the first time, what do you usually go on and on about what each other does, right? Because we define Tony, Shelby, Thomas, right, who are, by what we do, right? We, you know, we define ourselves by what we do in the world. The world uses doing as the identification of who we are. Now, why does this happen? Why is the world like this? Because in the very beginning, in Genesis 1 and 2, God says, he creates man, and he says, you are made in my image, and he gives us our identification. We're meant to live our lives as human beings in light of that, but what did the snake come and do? What did he come along and do? What did he say? God knows that if you eat that fruit, you'll be like him. That's why he doesn't want you to eat it, but they're already like him. They're already made in his image, right? They, they, they didn't need to do anything to become anything. God had already done everything to make them who he wanted them to be. Life was meant to be operating out of who they were, and everything they had done up to that moment was just an expression of their faith in God because he had given them their identity and told them what to do. So if we, we trace that from that's why God commands them, to be fruitful and multiply, right? That's the first command that he gives to them. God did not say, or it's not, but he tells them, be fruitful and multiply. God did not say, I made you, and if you do this, you'll become like me, right? If you do this thing, then you'll be made in my image. But he doesn't do that. He says, you are this because you're made in my image. Now, be fruitful and multiply. Do because of what you are, so from the very beginning, that's been the lie we've bought into. The world says, be who you are by what you do. That's why we look down on people that work in fast food, and we look up on people that are lawyers or whatever, right? Maybe not lawyers, but you know what I mean. We, we, look, we look up to people, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. It's, but that, that's what we do. We, we, we define people before we even know anything about them by what they do. Right? It's just our minds are full of that, those preconceived notions about who people are because of what they do. The world says, be who you are by what you do. God says, no, do because of who you are. And the trick of the devil is to constantly turn this around on us, even to believers, so that we stop believing the gospel as the source of our identity. Your behavior determines your identity. No, 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 that's a lie. Identity determines behavior. When you see fruit, it reveals root. It reveals what someone believes. So we have to speak the truth in love. We have to speak the gospel to someone in those moments. So let me give you an example. This is another one that I saw. I think this is really great. I, a lot of us struggle with this, so maybe this will be helpful. So let's say you're talking to somebody and what they're struggling with is anxiety, okay? They're just, they're worried, they're afraid, whatever it is, but they're suffering from, they're in the middle of anxiety. The answer in that moment is not, this has been a hard lesson to learn. The, 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 in that moment, you don't want to say, look, shame on you, stop worrying. Christians aren't supposed to worry, right? God will take care of it, stop worrying. Well, that's not the gospel. Instead, maybe we ask just sit down with somebody and say, what do you think you're worshiping right now that's making you so anxious? Right? What, what do you think's happening in your heart? What is your anxiety telling you is wrong? Anxiety is like a thermometer. Right? It, it, it tells us that something is off inside. Something is wrong. What's, you believe something and it's controlling you. It's making you anxious, afraid, worried, scared. Ask them, who do you believe you are right now, right? So let's go to the four questions. Let's look at this. Who is God? What has God done? Who am I? What have I done? Or what do I do? Now, actually, let's work here from, let's, let's see this, okay? Who is God? What has he done? Who am I? What do I do? So let's move back this time, because we're working with somebody from right to left. 
What do you, to the anxious, the person suffering from anxiety, right? What do you believe in this moment? What are you doing? I'm afraid. I'm worrying, right? Anxious, scared. Who are you? Right, well, I, if I'm honest, right, I believe I need to control my world. And I'm not, I believe I've lost control. That's why I'm anxious, right? I should be in control, but I've lost control. So you actually believe, you can you work through with them, you actually believe that you should be in control of the world. That's what you believe about yourself. But here's the thing. When you're talking to a believer, what do you believe about what God has done that would lead to your sense of anxiety? Right? What do you, who do you believe God is that, that you're so anxious, that you're so worried? Well, I think, um, to be honest, in this moment, I believe that he's abandoned me. I believe that um, he stopped loving me. I believe he's lost control and power. Now, what does that tell you about who God is, the God you're worshiping? Because remember this, beloved. All of that is true about the God they're worshiping in that moment. So if our answer to somebody is, don't worry about it, God is in control. This God isn't in control. This God is out to lunch. He doesn't care. He doesn't love. He abandons. And that's who they're worshiping in that moment. So it's not the gospel yet. It's not the truth that's revealed in Jesus for their anxiety. So here, you know, just, uh, you know what? I shouldn't be anxious. I'm sorry. I need to get better repentance isn't going to happen in a way that leads to life with just, hey, stop it, it's okay. Why? Because Jesus is the only way any of us will know the truth that God is in control. How do we know anything about who God is? He's revealed himself in Jesus. This person, even though they're a believer, they need the gospel in this moment. They've chosen to believe false religion. They've chosen to worship a false god. So the anxious person is worshiping a God who is absent, unloving, and impotent, powerless. That's what they're going through. I mean, of course, that makes it sound very simplistic. I don't mean it that way. This could take hours. It, this could take weeks. It could take months. Right? But this, this is what's going on. You're afraid and you're worrying because you believe you should be in control. And so you think God has abandoned you, stopped loving you, he's lost control and power. And so to you, God is absent, unloving, and impotent. You can do that in any situation in somebody's life. And now when you get that out in front of them, right? Let's say that, that they realize all this, right? What, are, what is the believer probably going to say in this moment? No, 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 I'm, I'm, I don't believe that. I don't believe that about God, but in this moment you do. That's who you're worshiping. That's who your God is in this moment. So let's, we take them back through it now. Now that they see that, that they realize what's going on on some level, now we walk them back through it the other way and ask them, what do you really believe about God? Well, I believe God loves me. How do you know that? What has God done to say that he loves you? Well, Romans 5.8 while I was still a sinner, he demonstrated his love for me and died for me, right? What else do you know about him? Well, I know that he's powerful. How do you know that about God? What did he do? Well, he raised his son from the dead on the third day and gave him life in the middle of the grave. So he loves me and he's powerful. Is he absent? No. No, God is present. How do you know that God is with you? Well, because he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell inside of me. What have we just done? We've preached the gospel to them, right? 
Where did repentance happen? Back here. As they're working out of unbelief to belief, they turn away from this false idea of God to faith in the true God through what? Through the truth of the gospel, right? Through the truth about Jesus. We've given them Jesus. You can't know God apart from Jesus. They have to have Jesus to know that they're loved, and we know that God is powerful. We know that he's always present. So in the moment, you can say in the moment when he was dying, when it looked like God had lost total control, that God was no longer sovereign, he was no longer over the whole universe, now we know, no, in that moment when it looked like God had no control, God was over everything. God raised Jesus from the dead. He was working out his sovereign, eternal, divine plan in the midst of all of that. And they moved from repentance to faith. And now they ask, all right, then who am I? Right? This is the process we lead each other through again and again and again for the rest of our lives if we have to. That's sanctification. Right? That's how we grow up together into maturity, into Christ, when we're so fluent in the gospel that we can speak it into any situation. That's God's design for us, for his family on mission. And listen, like I want to stress again, this takes time, right? It's, it's not the four questions. Are, are, they're a great model. They're, but to think that's an exact science, guys, this, this takes all kinds of conversation and work and time with each other. So don't shoot through it in five easy you know, quick fix minutes. It'll take more than that. This might take hours, like I said, or longer of talking and praying and working it out. So now we can ask this person, all right, so who are you in Christ? Who are you? Well, I'm loved like a child, right? I'm more than a conqueror. Trying to work on that. That's better, right? I'm loved like a child. I'm more than a conqueror, right? and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, right? I'm not alone. And so now, because that is true about who you are, what can you do? Well, I can walk in peace and love and joy, which is what? The fruit of the Spirit, right? We, we work through this with people, all through the scriptures, until we help them believe the gospel, repent of their sins, move into faith, realize who they are, realize because of who they are what they can do, and now through the gospel alone, by being fluent in the truth of the gospel, we move them out of the works of the flesh, God willing, into the works of the spirit by faith. Now, will this person struggle with anxiety again? Yeah, probably, you know, maybe the rest of their lives. But the process for us always is repent and believe, repent and believe over and over again. Satan will try to destroy every work of God in your life. Every move you make forward, he will be there to destroy it. That's what he does. But we believe the gospel. We believe the truth about who God is. And because of who he is, he has done something that changes who I am and how I live. And I will always be who he has made me to be. I will always, because I belong to him, be empowered by his spirit to do what he gives me to do. Now, just real quick, I saw somebody, was somebody waving their hands at me that I, is something messed up up here? No? Is it in my head? Okay, all right. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> so here's where we feel that, as we work through all that, right? You're, you're, you're watching this maybe, and so maybe you feel the temptation now to drift back into a much more comfortable idea of what church is right? Then family on mission. If that's what we're talking about, I got to, that's so much work. All right, do you really expect all of us to do that? No, your king does, right? Speaking the truth in love to one another all the time, exhorting one another every single day, as long as it is called today. This, and, and remember what Ephesians 4 teaches us Beloved, when we know the gospel, every, the intention of Christ for his church is that every single believer is mature enough in Christ to not be deceived, to not buy foolishness, to not buy wickedness, and to be mature enough to talk in some way like this to each other all the time. 
That's the intention of Jesus for his church. That's not a church program that somebody made up. That's his intention for his people, that they would all be mature enough to speak the truth and love to one another, growing each other up into Christ all the time. So the question, when you look at maybe what that would take to live like that, the question is, like I said at the beginning, do you want to rent your faith or do you want to own it? Do you want to give the time to Jesus that it requires to actually follow Jesus? We aren't quick fix people. We aren't in a rush. My goal, for example, is not to have 50 perfect marriages. My goal for you is that each one of you and your spouses believe in Christ. So if it takes us 60 years to do that, we'll take 60 years. But if we want, there, in other, there, aren't, there aren't nice little canned and packaged responses to what we deal with if we want to be his disciples. Lives are too complex. If we want to follow him, if we want to be his family on mission, if we actually want for ourselves and each other to grow up into Christ, which is the king's intention for us, the mission part's going to flow out of that. I'm not worried at all about that, right? When disciples are being made, mission always follows. That's what's in the DNA of a disciple. You're not a disciple unless you're making disciples. It naturally follows because another way, once the gospel lands and grips us and becomes the air that we breathe, not a few pieces of information that we got somewhere in the past to take care of our, no, no, before we really launched out into what it meant to be a Christian. No, once the gospel grips you, once the, the, the bigness of that gap is so clear in your heart and so clear in your mind, you're going to go public with it, I guarantee you. Think about how amped you get when you love something to make other people love it with you. If you don't believe that happens, go to a, a bar, sports bar, and watch a sports event with people and watch how the, this group gets mad at that group for not loving their team, right? We do this with our spouses all the time. You didn't like that movie, right? You don't want to go to that restaurant, right? So in other words, when praise is full, it comes out. When you actually love something, it comes out. And I just, when Jesus grips us, man, when we see that... He saved me, and I was like, that? Something is going to happen on the inside. Something is going to happen. So mission will flow out of doing what Jesus said to do. I love this quote from Mike Breen. He's the one that wrote the book Family on Mission. But listen, this is so good. We would much prefer the event to be the answer rather than the process. We would much prefer the conference with the amazing leader to be the key trigger instead of our life being the crucible of transformation. As we invest our life in another person who invests his or her life in another who does the same and so on and so on. Right, guys, that you have the Holy Spirit. Every single one of you that believes, you are as capable of this as Paul was. Do you understand that about yourselves? There's no, none of you in here are second tier and we've done that to ourselves. I really want to learn. I want to get something. So we'll go away to a conference where some great preacher, admittedly, is speaking. God has gifted him incredibly. But what, how do we think? I need to go somewhere to really dig in and get it. You can. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But you have the spirit that raised Christ from the dead inside of you right now. You don't need to go anywhere else to have it, beloved. This, however it looks, right? It doesn't, it's not like it has to be this way. But however it looks, Christ bought you raised you up, gave you new life so that you could live like this and talk like this and behave like this everywhere you go. And no, you, you don't become a nitpicking sin scout. It doesn't happen. So you just, oh man, what are you worshiping right now? What are you worshiping? I saw you eat that second cheeseburger, bro. You're worshiping food. No, no, no. We, we, don't, we don't do that. Why? Because as the gospel grips you, it's very unlikely that you're going to become pharisaical. Fruit and root, Right? So we just, that's just, that's what we do. We just, we got to invest in each other. We got to give ourselves to one another. And we just find out with one another. This is the last one. I'm almost done here. This will only take a second. Just real quick. The, here's what happened. Here's what happened in that anxiety example. That's a quick tree right there. But you got your fruit, right? What did we do? What's at the root? Who is God, right? 
by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay? What did he do? What did we tell him he did? The gospel, right? Who am I? I'm a new person, right? And what do I do? I do the fruit of the Spirit, right? All of this out of the root, right? That, that's, that's what we did for them. That's, that's how that process fits. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes from faith for faith. In other words, from the beginning to the end of your life as a member of this family, the gospel is the power to save you. We're called to keep believing in that, to keep speaking that gospel. And beloved, it works for everything. It really works for everything. These four questions are huge. They can really help us get a grasp on this. God is holy. He is for us. He has accomplished everything for our salvation in the gospel. He saves us. He makes us his dearly loved children, empowers and indwells us by his Holy Spirit to accomplish his mission, to do his will and glorify him with all that we are. So press into Jesus. We're going to come back next week. We're going to go a little further with kind of the how-to, some more practical application. But our goal here is to know Christ, to press into Jesus. All right? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and for the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, who would we be if it wasn't for who you are and what you've accomplished? We would have no hope. We would have no life. And you give us all these things forever, for all eternity, oh God, because of what your son accomplished once and for all. And we praise you and we thank you. And Lord, I'm asking that you would make us a gospel-fluent people, that the truths of the gospel would truly land in our hearts in such a way that they overflow. It's what you tend to do. You are a fountain. And so, Lord, would you care for us and watch over us? This we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. And if you have any questions about today's recording, Gateway Church, or what it means to follow Jesus Christ, you can reach us through the contact section of our website, gwbrawley.org.